uh, I, I wanted to change the scale. Now, well, we had a very large scale with Apple, but with a great dedication to details you know, in each place. Uh, I want to take a macro view of what's going on today in Eurasia, uh, the small Europe and the large Asia that are getting connected more and more, a process that is going very fast. It's quite difficult to follow because it's very fast and on a large scale. And uh, my, my goal was to, to try to represent it because I, I couldn't find a good map of what is going on. So it will be a, a journey through present, past, and future to try to understand what's going on. Today we have trains, freight trains, going from China all the way to Europe directly. That was not the case 10 years ago. That's a complete novelty. We have trains from China to Rotterdam. There's a route through the Caspian to Istanbul. There are direct trains to Tehran. It is part of the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative, or One Belt, One Road, that is trying to build uh, an infrastructure network all around Eurasia and further. And those rail, rail lines and trains plying the continent are the most visible illustration of that policy. At the same time, we have another parallel network that is a Russian initiative. You have the good old Trans-Siberian Railway and the newly established North-South Corridor that connects Russia through Iran all the way to India with the maritime part and with several routes, but the main one now is through Kazakhstan. Those two networks together, when we put them together, are the most visible manifestation of what we of a new geopolitical alliance called the BRICS, made of originally five countries, now expanding. The UAE just joined. That it, it's not an alliance, it's a cooperation between countries. Now, once again, the infrastructure shows the, shows the tangible part of that cooperation. But the network actually is much wider. It really encompasses all of the, the whole continent. It's quite complex. So I try to simplify it in finding the major routes, the major corridors that would explain how it functions, just like a metro map. So we have seven, seven major, major routes. Three horizontal, three vertical, and one orbital. We'll go through each one of them. I give them names for comprehension's sake. OK. Thanks to our screen, you don't see the, the continents, the, the whole continent. But well, the idea is there. You, you have first the, the Russian route. That's basically the Trans-Siberian route going from the, from the Pacific Ocean in Vladivostok all the way to Europe, to the Atlantic. The second, I call it the Sogdian. That's where the title of the talk comes from. The Sogdians were an old people living in Central Asia with the, their capital in Samarkand, and they were the major traders in Eurasia for centuries. So that route goes from the seashore in China through the Tarim Basin, crossing the Tian Shan, going through Central Asia all the way to the Black Sea and onwards to Europe, or Constantinopolis in old times. And the third one, horizontal, goes from the Mediterranean through the Syrian desert and Mesopotamia, to India, and all the way to China through Bur Burma. We take the vertical ones. I call it the, the Chinese one, because that's the main part of the, of, of the line. It's a north-south connection from all the way from Manchuria to Singapore. Second is the central one that connects Siberia to Central Asia and down to India. And the last vertical one is the, the Caspian, the Iranian connection. That's the one you saw in the north-south corridor, connecting Russia to, to Iran and Dubai as the gateway to Iran. And the last one is the maritime route that's, uh, that, that's connecting everything th through the south from the Mediterranean, Suez Canal, around India, and all the way to China and Guangzhou. Those seven routes have always been present through history at some level. Some were more important, some less important, some appeared on the way. And uh, 
to try to understand why we are where we are today and what happened before, uh, I would like to dive into history, we're starting from today and going back in time to see what happened. Today we are in a time of reconnection. That's what's going on. In the last 20 years, the network has been reconnected. It starts with the, f w before that, between China and Russia, there was only the connection of the Trans-Siberian Railway. Then in the 90s, we get the new connection through Central Asia. The dry ports of Alashanku and Horgos, you've never heard about it, but in the years to come, you will hear only that, only that. All the trains are passing there. Then we have the development of the high-speed railway in China that was lightning fast. In 20 years, they've built way more, several times more than the whole world combined. And one of those connections have now been established through Laos. That was the missing link between China and Indochina and Thailand and Singapore. Now we can have direct trains plying the whole north-south route. In the 90s, we had the connection between Central Asia and Iran established, which allows us to take trains all the way to Istanbul with the Marmaray Tunnel under the Bosphorus now operational. Why did we need a reconnection? It means that the links were severed. There was a whole period of time, a few centuries, when we had segregated networks in Asia. For each of those eras, I'm choosing the appropriate map, the appropriate projection to get into the mood. This is the UN map, azimuthal pro projection from the North Pole. And uh, for those couple of centuries, we had essentially one European network extended through the Trans-Siberian all the way to China and several networks in the South that were disconnected. There was no connection between the British Empire sphere and the Russian Empire sphere. The connection was intentionally broken for military and strategic re re reasons. And to illustrate that, uh, the best is to look at travelers. Uh, during the First World War, you had the Czechoslovak Legion established in, uh, in Russia. The, 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 they were prisoners of war from the Austrian Empire and wanting to fight on the side of the Allies. Uh, when the war was, even before it was over, they, they were trying to get back to Europe, but it was impossible from Russia to get back to Europe across the front lines. Oh, sorry. So the fastest and most reliable route for them was a, to take the Trans-Siberian Railroad all the way to Vladivostok, cross the Pacific, cross the US, and come back on the Atlantic side. And that's what they did. That was the only way to get back home. That's how the networks were segregated at the time, even though it was possible to travel much faster than before. How did it come to be? We had a moment of bypass. Eurasia is a huge landmass, huge population, all those routes were there, but at one point, the main route that was applying the center of the landmass were bypassed. In the northern, the northern part, uh, the Russian Empire established a direct route, direct caravan route to India. Sava Vladislavic, fellow Serb, established with the Chinese the common border between China and Russia in the 1700s. Even before that, the Portuguese discovered the way to sail all around Africa and got to Indian Ocean directly, thereby bypassing completely the central routes and establish, establishing a completely new route in the south and a virtual monopoly on trade, actually a kind of racket to control that trade. But to make a bypass, you have to bypass something. And the period that was before those, that, that bypass was full integration of the Eurasian network. That's my favorite world map. It's from, from a Persian cartographer, Ali Stakhri, representing the whole world at the time. You have the Mediterranean Sea here with the islands. You have the Indian Ocean and the Persian Gulf here. Arabia, all of Asia. A schematic representation of the world at the time, pure schematic map from 10th, 10th century. The integration was started by the expansion first of the large, of the big religions, 
Buddhism and Christianism, but mostly Islam, that connected all, all of those lands. And then came the Mongol Empire, physically and politically integrating all of Eurasia, save Constantinopolis and Western Europe, and save Egypt and India. All the rest was one empire, one legal system, and full protection for all travelers and merchants. Today, most people think that nobody traveled from China to Europe or Europe to China through history. Oh, it's something new. No, it's nothing new at all. This was quite common in that time. We had full, absolute full integration. The most well-known of those travelers on the Western side was Marco Polo, who plied almost all of the, those routes, starting from Venice, through Iran, all the way to China, wandering around China, getting back through the maritime road and through Constantinopolis back home. There were travelers, Ibn Battuta went the lower route, there were also east-west travelers. It's hard to imagine today that it, it, in those so-called dark times, actually it was a thriving trade network and people were freely traveling from one end to the other under Mongol protection. Before the integration, we first needed the connection. That's the times of the Roman Empire, the Macedonian Empire, the Qin Empire in China. This is the representation of the world that you find in, Her in Herodotus' uh, history. That's what the Greeks at the time knew more or less about the world. And at the center of it are the royal roads that were built first by the Assyrian, then expanded by the Persians. And that's the first road network that plied Central Asia. Alexander the Great traveled most of those routes in conquering the, the Persian Empire. But we, you, China is here highly compressed. The West had not much idea of what was going on further east. But we had also travelers coming from China towards the West. Fasian was a, a pilgrim who was looking to go to India to find old books to confirm all the teachings, all the Zen Buddhist teachings in China. So he traveled all the way by land, by foot, to India, coming back by way of the sea. Even before Gan Ying was a Han envoy to the Roman Empire, who was trying to get to establish the, road, the route all the way to Rome. Didn't went all the way to Rome, finished his journey in the Persian Empire in Mesopotamia. But still, those were the first connections between several separate networks. And before the connections, we had the encounters of people wandering around Eurasia and encountering each other. This is, we, we have no maps from those times. It was ancient times. We have no, not even descriptions of maps from those times. We don't know if there were world maps established. But the world view, the most ancient one that we have of Eurasia is the Let's call, let's call it Indo-European, Aryan, Persian, Avesta, Sanskrit, uh, Veda, all in common. It's seven circles. Seven regions of the world as separate regions but interconnected with Central Asia and Iran, Khorasan at the center and six big zones all around, all interconnected. And we, we don't have written description of those times, but we have traces of those first encounters. The lapis lazuli uh, stone, which was used and for sculptures and for, for paint, you find it everywhere in those seven zones. And there was only one query, only one mine in Afghanistan, in Badakhshan, where you could find it. So it had to travel from that place everywhere else. You see the same thing with the, with the DNA haplogroup R1A which is probably the group, a couple group of the bearers of the Indo-European languages, that we find everywhere in a very short period. That means they, they were capable of going from one realm to another in those ancient times. And those ancient times with those clusters, those seven clusters interconnected, will help us, us jump back to where we are today. It seemed that uh, in the last 
30 years since glo the globalization movement started in the 90s, that one large meta structure was going to encompass the whole world, that everything is going to get standardized with one language, one custom, one way of life. It seemed like that. It was going on pretty well, and then it was scuttled. And what we see now is the appearance of several clusters. We don't have any more, just one meta structure. We have several smaller meta structures appearing with economic and cultural commonalities and slight differences with the others, but still interconnected into a single network. But for that network to be complete and those clusters to really take the shape that, going to, that we, we, we see them taking, there are some missing links. I have identified seven missing links that are already on the way of being completed. Some of them, some of them are in the, the, the realm of dreams. But you would notice that all those links are in places of conflict today. Those are places where we are witnessing some sort of conflict. And if things go as they seem to be going historically, all those conflicts are going to be resolved in a very short time and those uh, seven links completed. I use railroads to illustrate that always, but there are much wider mechanisms. Let's review those uh, seven links, starting with co the Korean link. Today, nobody is thinking about taking a high-speed train from Beijing to Tokyo through Korea. But that's something that in very short time we might be witnessing. Direct trains, no border anymore, and the Korea having a central, playing a central part in the connection between Japan with another sea, tunnel on the Tsushima Strait, and then one connection towards Vladivostok and Harbin and all the way to Europe with Japanese goods and Korean goods traveling by train all the way to Europe, and another connection directly to Beijing. I'm trying to predict the future. But it's logical. Second link, the Burmese link, which is part and parcel of that southern route through India all the way to China. That part is missing today. There's only railroad inside Myanmar. We have the, the Indian network, the Chinese network, which, was, which is now connected to Thailand, and this part is missing. We are missing the direct link from India to the Pacific Ocean and from China to the Indian Ocean, bypassing the Malacca Strait. You will see that happen in a few years. The Afghan link, talk about conflict. Afghanistan was a country that was formed in between, with, with this name, in between the British Empire in India, the Russian Empire in Central Asia, and the Persian Empire on the West. And it was an, uh, an interstate agreement that no railroad will cross Afghanistan, so as to avoid conflict between the empires. So it has remained still an empty spot on the map with the Hindu Kush massive in the center. And up, uh, so the logical prediction is that our Central Asian route and the Southern route will get connected with around the Hindu Kush with four connections to the existing network. Some of those links, part of them exists and there are plans to accomplish exactly that. Then you can have direct trains from India all the way to Russia. We're in the Emirates, the Emirati link. Isn't that beautiful? From Dubai to Isfahan. Sounds perfectly logical. Etihad Rail already started building the Emirati part the Saudi have a plan to link Kuwait, Riyadh, and Abu Dhabi. The Iranians are already constructing the Isfahan Ahwaz railroad, and we just need one small part in Iraq, and we have a nice semicircle connecting all the main cities in the Persian Gulf region. 
seems quite plausible to, to finish it in 10 years. And then give birth to the local cluster. The Levantine link, my favorite. There was a railroad going through Levant. It was, you had the Baghdad railroad from Berlin through Constantinopolis to Baghdad and Basra, and the Hejaz railroad going all the way down to Medina. They were severed, they were destroyed. Now they don't exist. But why would we not have two parallel lines, one on the coast, one in the hinterland, just as all the trade routes and all the military routes always went in Levant, with connecting points like a ladder, and you would take a high-speed train from Gaza to Aleppo in two and a half hours. Sounds beautiful, right? You'll see it happen. Serbian link, I have to do a bit of uh, <laughs> local patriotism. But it's a very similar situation to what we have in Afghanistan, in Levant. Is we have a blank hole in the middle of a big network. Okay, here the, the rail exists, but it's in a decrepit state. So what is happening now is that the north-south axis is being rebuilt as we speak by Chinese and Russian companies, not for the sake of Belgrade or the Serbs enjoying it, but for the sake of linking the harbor in Piraeus and Thessaloniki to the center of Europe. And we will see the same thing happening from Istanbul to Trieste. And having that strong X in the middle of the Balkans connecting the European and the Middle Eastern network. See, all, the, all those conflicts will get solved automatically. We connect people, we ship goods. And the last one is the symmetric one to the Indian Ocean maritime route, is the Arctic link. In the Arctic Ocean, you have pack ice during half of the year, which is changing now. More and more uh, months in the year are navigable. But uh, the Russians have developed a full fleet of nuclear-powered uh, icebreakers, which today enable ships to sail all year long in the Arctic Ocean, thereby shortcutting the southern route even through Suez Canal and shipping goods directly from Russia to China without anybody's interference. That's the northern route that is being inaugurated as we speak. Multipolar is the expression of these days. It's saying there's not one pole and one system. There are multiple system, systems that function together. And those are the seven routes plus the new one in the, the north, with all the missing links completed. And everything, all of Eurasia, integrated into one whole, one network, but one network which allows each cluster to develop in its own way. Uh, I invented this representation. It's like a, a schematic, like those old Persian maps, to, to show the, the world of today with those six main land routes connecting everything. And, um, I hope that this, uh, this representation of what happened before, what is happening now, will give you a different perspective on all the works that are happening now, all the new things, that, all the new connections that are being built. It's not just infrastructure. It's way more than that. It's a shift in eras. Just as the old eras that we have been witnessing, now a completely different era has started and the railroads are just the most tangible manifestation of it. Thank you. Thank you, Yug. You always come with something ultra creative to this symposium. <laughs> uh, any questions for Yug? Oh, back there. I noticed as you spoke of the, about the sort of historical travelers, you spoke of the people. 
But as you were showing those, you were also talking about goods. Um, that's a weird thing we struggle with today, right? We're okay with shipping goods, but people isn't really okay as a way of crossing borders. It seems to be the bigger problem than uh, whether we're connected or not. Are we allowed to connect is another big question. Um, <clears throat> if you look at old times, all those trade routes that we talk about were mostly for shipping goods. Then some people travel just for the sake of traveling or for, for some pilgrimage religious uh, reasons. But those people who were traveling, be them pilgrims or merchants, were also transmitting ideas. But the primary goal was shipping goods, just as today, uh, shipping people, people traveling. Uh, let's face it, today it's easy. You take a plane, you can go anywhere. So you, can, you could go anywhere. This is a manifestation of flows that are much more potent and much more powerful. All those railroads that are being built, they are primarily for shipping goods. Then when there's some space left, yeah, you can send a high-speed uh, train for, for people. But they are primarily for goods, and they are now being developed as high-speed freight corridors. So that's the big novelty compared to before. So that's why I insist here on the freight trains, because that's the manifestation now. But in all those missing links that I have shown that are going to be built, I can perfectly imagine passenger trains going. But they will not come first. They come after. I would, I would like to know how transport power, I guess. So I don't hear. I, I guess I was more saying that actually humans don't want people to travel that easily. Like you can jump on a train, but we here at NYU see a lot of our students with passport power and less passport power. And the reality is to go on a spring break trip somewhere with a passport that has an e-visa, it's a breeze when you need to go to yeah. six different embassies. And so I think you're bringing out that, that could, the question of why do we have this sort of, why do we accept passport power as a concept to allow human, humans to travel uh, across borders, right? So I think this, will, this really brings up a really, it brings up the question. Basically. Yeah, that, that was the point of the dive into the past, to show that that was not the case before, at all times. It was not, oh, we always had passports and borders, etc. No, that's one era of development of humanity where we have that kind of borders, that kind of passports. The, the, the passports are a recent invention, a few hundred years ago. It's, not, it's, not a, it's a very new thing. We had several periods before that where passports did not exist. There was no, the, the only hindrance to people traveling was uh, security from bandits and attack and surviving the harsh environment that you have to cross. So I'm trying to outline the near future. Uh, I think most of those impediments are going to disappear. Thank you. Uh, maybe a question out of what has arised recently is, uh, maybe uh, was that the case that the rail was uh, left behind due to the growth in the travel industry, the air industry? or the shipping industry, and, and that was on the shoulders of the rail, plus what was just asked now, I think. I'm, I'm just thinking of, of what, you, what you're raising here is something uh, smart, and uh, I think this is maybe difficult to achieve in the future, because the passport and who are you, where are you from, will always stay, unfortunately, from the way things are going. But uh, eventually, the, the rail was such a magnificent uh, transport tool for, for hundreds of years. And today, we are behind rather than using such a great uh, travel uh, system. So maybe the question is, was that left behind because of the air traffic and the business behind and the people who benefited from that industry at the time? So we're stuck, as it seems, and, and, and what you're aiming for here is something great, but is that achievable, really? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, it, it's a consequence of the bypass. The bypass north and the bypass south were done in 1500s and 1700s, and then with the, the use of the steam engine for railroads, locomotives, and for ships, those two bypasses acquired a tremendous power because that's where that, that steam engine power was employed. And all the other routes just got erased 
compared to, do, to the northern and the southern route. Uh, then with the segregation, the maritime route overtook everything. The planes uh, and don't play much importance here because you cannot ship goods by planes in the quantity you can with boats and, uh, and trains. So those are orders of magnitude different. Yes, people can travel, but, no, but not goods. So uh, it, it's about the reconnection. It's about the, the northern and southern route not having monopoly anymore with new routes being created where I use the trains as a symptom of that. It's, it's a pity that we don't have trains anywhere, every, everywhere. We just select parts. No, we, we can have them everywhere and that's what is going on. Because they, are, they allow us to not be reliant on the shipping lanes, on the maritime shipping lanes, which have, well, you know, all the geopolitical implications of the, the straits and the control. When you're inside the landmass, no one can stop you. You can put rails anywhere. If they get removed, you, you put some new rails, it's easy. So, so that's why I took the, the rail network as a tangible manifestation of that strong reconnection that is taking, that, that is taking shape now. On the sea, you cannot see it. The, the boat goes and you don't see the, the trail of the boat. The train you see, it is physical, it's there. Yeah, I think uh, a lot of thoughts went into my, it's not a question, but just a reflection of your presentation. I think uh, a lot of thoughts went into my mind when I was listening to this presentation. There's uh, a book by Paul Thiraw came to my mind, if you have, and I don't know whether you've read it. It's I didn't hear what? Paul Thiraw. He's an author. He writes oh. a lot of travelogues. And he has written a book called The Great Indian Railway Bazaar. And he has also written a book on a train journey, which happens, starts from London and comes all the way to India and goes across and ends in Burma. And uh, uh, so that, that's not old, but that's recent. So that's one. Second is, I think I really love the way you have used uh, the power of maps to explain or probably look at a speculative future, which is the strong way in which I think that I don't think there is a point in discussing about whether it will happen or not. But the case in <laughs> here is like you have such a strong medium to even project what might happen. And that's, that's brilliant. I think I really loved the way you presented it. What we were saying in Maps We Trust, we can say this border will be open or that trail will be built. But when you show it on a map, it looks like, yeah, it looks real. Why is it not there? Why is it missing? Just a small remark uh, regarding the discussion about AI and uh, what we mentioned. All the images that are illustrated, the maps are handmade, but all the images are AI generated, all of them. It's faster to do that now than to search for images and put them. Um, just want to say one thing. That, uh, there's, a, there's a maxim for conference, you know, never use the time for question for short lecture or anything else, but I'm going to make an exception. <laughs> yeah, for myself, no. Uh, I don't have a question for you. I just have a big thank you. Uh, this 20 minutes has been the demonstration of, you know, why I do repeat, why they don't people listen more to designer? don't understand what designer can bring to the table. Here we had, via the medium of imagining a railroad network or just looking at what's happening around the world, a railroad network, we delve into history, geography, politics, with a vision of hope for the ultimate goal of a designer, which is contribute to a better world. And uh, thank you. Just thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? About uh, missing link. Uh, uh, other six is uh, in the land, uh, but the seventh is the Arctic one, is in the sea. Uh, it is, it is uh, just not geopolitical, it is just a technical problem, yes? 
Well, it's more than technical. It is geopolitical because the Bering Strait is controlled by both Russia and uh, the US. So it's still the choke point. But it, was, it is mostly there, first of all, because it does exist. It is a new link. And because I, I love symmetry. I want one in the south and one in the north. You know, <laughs> I need the circle. Yeah, that was really interesting. Uh, I just have a question. How you come up with the names for routes, especially like as a person from Central Asia, like one of the routes there is Tartarian, yeah. and it's my first time hearing it. And I Googled, it's, apparently it's like some Western thing, how you call it. So I was just curious, like, how did you come up with these names? And like, if are you planning to rename them maybe, like to represent the populations who are living in these regions better? Yeah. Uh, I've spent years sketching this and changing the names on the way, uh, trying to schematize it enough to have proper seven routes and not just a tangle. So I changed the names of those routes many times, looking for all historic name, future names. And, but in the end, when I was building the lecture, uh, those eras that are represented, it's not like one fixed time, it's several centuries as an era. So during each of those names of things have been changing, but I had to show it on a map. So I had to ch choose the names of the cities, for example, even though they were completely anachronistic because they would be raised during the, the era, for example. So in the end, I chose to, to try, uh, try to have uh, like obvious names for those routes. Something that is maybe anachronistic, like Sogdian, completely anachronistic today. The Sogdians don't exist anymore. I mean, it's a, just the remainder of an, of an old language, but it illustrates the position. It's not perfect, I know. Like the southern route, the southern and the most western could both be called the Iranian. So it's not a perfect way, but it illustrates the clusters that are being formed. The Chinese, Indian, Russian, Iranian. So I wanted those names to appear, even though, yes, is it def can you defend it politically or not? Uh, but it's an exercise of projection, so. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah. Last call. It was, oh. it was first Horasan route, Gandhara route, Bactriana route. Then I, I took uh, the physical features. The northern one was the forest route, then you had the steppe route, the oasis route, and it has been changing a lot. <laughs> Yes, uh, just as you being nation nationalistic as a Serbian, I would like to ask about me as an Indonesian, uh, why uh, the the Chinese route stopped short at Singapore? Because if it's in the context of Belt and Road Initiative, Indonesia also receives some projects like the high-speed railway, so might want to know the, the reason. Uh, I have a very easy answer. It's Eurasian paradigm. That's why I have to cut it somewhere, so I don't have the connection to the Swahili coast. I don't have the connections to Indonesia because I had to cut somewhere, otherwise I would make it global. But that was not the point. The point was to look at the continent. That's the only reason. And it's not the, the map of, of the Belt and Road Initiative. Belt and Road Initiative is just part of all of that. Thank you. All right. I think that's it. Okay. Thank you, Yug.